Everyone can hear me fine? Can I get my first slide up? Ah, this is the moment when you all go, oh, isn't that beautiful? And we're going to start off with a few slides that are stunning. And that's to reward you all for coming away from the coffee and the teas and all the wonderful things outside and coming in here to talk about story. So it's a pleasure to be here. And 5% of my time is spent in these sorts of environments. This is in Cooper's Creek, which looks stunning at the moment with all the anna branches in full flood. My friend Nerida and I are in Longreach a few months ago, and she said, Shuan, the bucket list, which is you've got to do it before you kick the bucket. I do not like being airborne, but I went up in a helicopter to fly over this sort of um, amazing landscape. So that particular bucket list one has been ticked. Another beautiful wetland scene, a lovely rainforest, and then this sort of an environment which is where I spend a lot of my time, the big rivers, big inland rivers of Australia where a lot of our agriculture is um, and is actually realised. So this is on Murray. And this is a sheep property in Burra, South Australia, where we were doing some work with the wool growers there to improve biodiversity outcomes which was a little tricky in a landscape like this, which had been in drought for many, many years. But the wool growers I was working with loved and were passionate about this place. Or this one, which is the Bega River, which as you can see is choked by sediment. It's got blue-green algae, very little vegetation on the riverbank. And this is where we actually see how humans interact with their environment. Our environment is a barometer of how we interact with it. This one is a very large gully in a sodic soil just beyond Yass, where I live near Canberra. And these sheep have been running up and down this gully for a very long time. It's actually a restoration site and it doesn't look like that anymore. Again, working with wool growers, we worked out that we could put a few dams into this gully and actually stop the gully erosion and stop the sediment from going out the bottom. But these are the environments that I work in day to day, 95% of the time. And the images that I was showing you at the beginning are the sucker for my soul. I need to be able to see those places so I can keep doing what I'm doing. And this one here, which I still see a lot around the country, never fails to amaze me how people who have cows in the water don't think about the people who are downstream. Because when cows are in water, they like to hang out there. It's a great chill out zone. There's things that emanate from the rear end of a cow, which then quite happily make their way down the river. However, if you get the farmer who's doing this to meet the person who lives downstream, it's amazing how quickly they will actually move the cows out of the river. It's a connection to people and place that makes the difference. But when I started working with scientists, oh, it must actually be, it's more than 11 years now, it's about 18 or 19 years, they would say to me, why the hell are people doing this? Why are they managing their land so badly? Why are the cows in the stream? Why does Gippsland have very few trees in it? The reason Gippsland has very few trees in it is because there was actually a law made that you had to clear a certain amount of vegetation in order to keep your lease. So there's a whole lot of political and governance issues as well as social issues that re are reflected in the way we relate to our land. But for a lot of the scientists I work with, it's why. Why, when we are giving them all this information and telling them exactly what to do, aren't they changing their behaviour? She's really quite cross because she's frustrated. Why, when I write these wonderful journal articles, which are beautifully presented in black and white and in tiny, tiny text, why aren't people reading that and just changing their behaviour? Well, I think you've probably all got a bit of an idea why that might be the case. Because for most of us, we feel like this, overloaded with information. I don't watch the news. For, some, for weeks at a time because I can't stand all the information that's thrown at me, even though that's actually delivered by someone speaking. In terms of my in-tray, it often looks like this. It's just information. It's meaningless unless I can relate to it. And oftentimes I feel like this poor guy here. My brain is full. I can't take any more information. It's just full. So what are we going to do in this sort of a situation? This is why we're ending up here. This is why we're actually in a situation, I don't know how many of you saw Clive Hamilton's talk before lunch, which was articulate, very well presented and incredibly depressing, but it was because of all the information he gave us. And even though it, it, it is relevant information, it is not touching us enough. It's actually making us go, oh, 
give up now, can't deal with it. Or it's information that's not told with a person in the story. When you personalise it, or when Karen was saying, when you put a species into that story, it becomes real. So all that information, we need a second opinion. We've only got 25,000 people telling us that global warming's happening. Look at the Murray-Darling Basin. We need a whole new basin plan. The one that we've got's wrong. I happen to know that the basin plan is actually on very good science, 40 to 50 years worth of science, because I used to work at the Murray-Darling Basin Commission. But we're still saying, no, second opinion. This information just isn't cutting it. Why do we bother then? Lots of scientists will say to me, why bother? If people won't listen to what we're telling them, and the key word there is the telling, why should we bother? I believe that scientists and people with this sort of information are socially accountable for the work that they're doing, and that society actually wants to be able to use evidence to make decisions. It's just how we present that evidence and information to people as to whether they'll actually relate to it and take it up. So these are some of the people that I've worked with. And the thing about all these people is that they each think they're unique and individual. Now, how many of you in this room are exactly the same as the person sitting next to you? I'm really pleased no one put their hand up. <laughs> Why is it then that we think one form of information will suit everyone? We're all different. Why, why could I just produce something for Nerida and it'll also meet Finn's needs? It won't. So producing a one-size-fits-all or taking a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. What does work for these people, for Brendan and for Clive and for Richard and for Tom, is someone telling a story. Because when someone tells a story, Tom might be thinking, oh yeah, I actually remember seeing something where that related to me. Or Richard Weatherly, who has a fabulous property in Victoria, will be saying, oh yeah, that story reminds me of a time where I used to go and paint. He actually paints landscapes as well as run an amazing wool property. Or Brendan Lunny in the top right hand corner there with the two dogs up there, he's actually a Sydney cider who wants to become a farmer and become known as a farmer. But whenever he goes into the Yass community, they keep labelling him as a film producer. And he's trying desperately to get his creds up, you know, to become a real, a real farmer. So he's got the right dogs and he's got a rusty truck, even though he could, you know, he could actually have a BMW, I'm sure. Um, and he's getting there. He's really getting there. <laughs> These are all people with stories to tell. And the information I produce, and it is information, is information that they can then take and turn into knowledge. All of us in this room are highly knowledgeable people. And knowledge is when that information or any information that we're given is shared and we can actually take it in and think it through and often tell it back in the way of a story, so it touches us personally. Now, this is the Kinevin framework. I didn't think that you'd get off so lightly on a Sunday afternoon. This is your theory for the afternoon.